I was asked to make one announcement about a, um, and I couldn't get the slides to work right now to, uh, to um, make it work, so I'm just going to tell you about it. There's a, uh, the Harvard Undergraduate Bioethics Society is holding a symposium called Biology to Policy, Reproductive Ethics, and um, it's going to be held next Saturday, April the 13th, from 1.30 to 3.30 at the Ticknor Lounge. And they pertinently note here that sushi, pad thai, and cookies will be served. Don't eat all those at once. And they have, the speakers include um, uh, Caridwin Luis, uh, who's um, a college fellow in studies of women, gender, and sexuality, uh, Steve Hyman, the former provost here, and Glenn Cohen, talking about um, reproductive ethics. Next Saturday, uh, the Harvard Undergraduate Bioethics uh, Society. All right, oops, oh, darn. So, all right. So, um, so these past three lectures, we've been exploring the rules governing how human beings assemble themselves into social networks. Uh, and we've learned a little bit about what living in networks means for our lives, how it can affect our behaviors, our emotions, our attitudes, and even infections. Uh, and last time, we saw a bit about how this knowledge might be exploited to intervene in the world, both offline and online, uh, suggesting a number of very practical and actually, I think, kind of radical or novel um, approaches one might use in the field of uh, public health. Still, the question remains, What's the point of a connected life? How does it help us as individuals and as a species? And it turns out that networks are a resource that we can all use. Networks are a kind of social capital. And this notion of social capital is, to me, one of the most interesting ideas in the social sciences. Most people, when they think about capital, think about money. But really, capital is any stock of resources that can be put to productive use. So capital is a stock of resources with which you can do something, with which you can make something. And two further key ideas about capital are that in order to create capital, you have to invest skill and effort. You have to know something and do something in order to create capital. And second, and more important, and more subtle, and much more interesting, that it is this, that in order to create capital, you have to make changes in a substance that make it yield a higher rate of return than it otherwise would. So the whole process of creating capital is to do with manipulating the world, changing the material substance of the world in such a fashion that that change makes the substance more productive than it otherwise would be. And in fact, you might argue that this is the most fundamental definition of what capital actually is. So think about this, for example, a farm is a stock of capital, and by investing skill and labor to clear the woods, one can make the land more productive than it previously was, more productive of fruits and grains and, and vegetables, for example. So land, especially improved land, is a form of capital. We work upon the world, we know something and do something, we transmute the world, we turn the forest into a farm, and that farm can do things that the, the forest couldn't do. And that's what makes it valuable. That's what makes it a reservoir of wealth and a source of productive power. Or, for example, this tree. You can invest skill and effort and mill the tree into lumber. And the lumber is more valuable than the tree because you can do things with the lumber that you couldn't do with a tree, such as invest still more skill and effort and convert the lumber into a violin. And the violin is more valuable than the lumber because you can do things with the violin you couldn't do with the lumber, namely make music. And a violin, therefore, is a stock of capital, a reservoir of wealth, it costs a lot, uh, and a source of productive power. So capital is a change that allows a substance to act in new ways. And this is part of what makes it a store of wealth and a source of productive power. Or, for example, consider this example. You can take this lump of uh, iron ore, you can work upon it, manipulate it, and convert it into a hammer. And a hammer or an ax or some other tool is more valuable than the iron ore, because you can do things with it you couldn't do with the iron ore, such as further deploy it and make it into a jet engine, which is you can do things with a jet engine that you couldn't do with a hammer. It makes it much more valuable, obviously. 
Now, a key innovation uh, in thinking in the social sciences took place in the 1960s, and we began to see people and their skills and talents as a form of human capital. And the chief example of this is education. If we endow someone with skills and knowledge, we have changed them and have made them more productive. And so, for example, you can take this dissolute former graduate student of mine on the far left, who is a drunkard, and, uh, and you can invest skill and effort, and you can clean him up and, uh, and uh, render him no longer alcoholic uh, in the middle. And he's more productive now than he was before. Or you can invest still more skill and effort and give him an education. You can work upon his mind. You can change the neurons. You change his brain. And you make this person more productive, more capable of doing things than he was before. He's now more valuable. He's a stock of human capital. And in fact, we have changed these individuals in these steps in a way similar to the other types of capital we've been discussing. And we can earn a return on our investment, uh, the investment that we've made, yielding income uh, from this type of a process, just like the other processes I just showed you. Now let me ask you this. Are there other things that you can imagine that we could do to our bodies other than educate ourselves to make us more productive? What else can we do to our bodies other than give ourselves an education? A gym, yeah. We can work on our physical bodies, right? And if you work on your physical body, you make an investment, you can become stronger or healthier, and now you're able to do things that you weren't able to do before. And these types of things can make us live longer and be fitter, both of which are productivity enhancing, both of which are valuable. And in fact, many have argued that health itself is a stock of human capital. What about this kind of change? Is this productive? Yes or no? Yeah, in the back. Oh, thumbs up. Yes, it is, but she's not going to comment. OK. Other ideas? Yes, Vegas. Okay. Other people can see it as noise pollution and that's, that's exactly right. So it depends on your perspective. This type of a change to this person's body could be productive if it increases her ability to do something. Okay? Now, for example, certain kinds of tattoos might be very valuable if you were a sex worker and you had that kind of a tattoo, you might be able to attract more clients. However, if it wasn't productivity enhancing, it could be seen simply as a consumption good, right? Like you might consume a product, you might eat a piece of cake, it doesn't necessarily increase your productivity, or view a piece of art, or listen to a piece of music, it can simply be something you consume. It's not productivity enhancing. So this type of a, 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 a change to your body, a tattoo, for example, whether or not it is a form of human capital depends on your perspective. What about this tattoo? Oh, come on, surely you guys have some ideas about this. Is this tattoo a form of human capital, or is it a consumption good? Raise your hands if you think it's a form of, if it's a capital investment. Raise your hands if you think it's a consumption good. Raise your hands if you don't know. Okay, who said it was an uh, investment? Someone over here, yeah, why? How could it be? Understood. Yeah, so if he, if he wanted to, for example, earn income by this, who knows what this tattoo actually is? Has anyone ever seen a tattoo like this before? Yeah? Yes. That's right. It can be a status marker, but who knows which tribe? Does anyone, everyone seen a picture like this before? Yeah. Yes, Maori. And why do the Maori warriors do this type of tattoo to their face? Does anyone know? Because they're awesome, yes, okay. <laughs> why do the warriors do this? There's... Okay, so that, now, now the, the symbolic utility of that is different than the capital investment. What's the other reason that, you, that they might have done this? Yeah. To intimidate other 
Yes, to frighten their enemies. Okay? So that is a form of human capital. You get this kind of facial tattoo. You could do it to earn money in a freak show, like was just suggested. But that would be one capital investment. You could do it simply for show. That would be a consumption good. But if you do it to frighten your enemies, huh? that is a form of human capital investment. How about these types of changes? How about plastic surgery modifying your body to make it more productive, right? You're a movie star, you can have certain kinds of plastic surgery, work upon your body, and that makes you earn a higher rate of return that you previously, than you previously did. The woman on the left is Salma Hayek, I, right, I think, and that's uh, Tom Cruise. Okay, so just like physical capital is created by a change in the material world, and human capital by a change in persons, Social capital is a change in the relations among persons, a change that renders the group more productive and capable of doing things it was not previously able to do. And social capital, which is a really important idea in this class, and I, it's one of the like five ideas I hope you remember 10 years from now, if you remember anything I've taught you, uh, can arise in at least two senses from social structure. First, social capital can arise because of what is flowing within the group through these connections. Are you a member of a group through which is flowing information, germs, emotions, altruism, ideas, or what? Okay? The flow of those goods and services through the group of which you are a part is a kind of, human ca is a kind of social capital upon which you can draw and by which you might be affected. So the first sense in which social capital can arise from social structure has to do with what's flowing through the group. Are you a member of a trusting group? That's a valuable thing to be, to be a member of a trusting group, okay? You can do something with that. Second is not by what's flowing, but rather how the group is organized, how it's connected. So it's back again to this contagion and connection dichotomy we discussed the last time. And social capital, like other forms of capital, has the following attributes, some of, which, some of these of which were reviewed in the very classic, famous paper by James Coleman that you were assigned for today. First of all, it inheres in aspects of social structure. Social capital, I do not use the Bourdieu or the, even the Putnam definitions of social capital. Social capital is not a property of you yourself. There we might say cultural capital. So for example, cultural capital might be whether you know about the opera or jazz, for example, okay? That's an attribute of yourself. Social capital is a property of groups. It's not a property of individuals. It inheres in aspects of social structure. It's created by a change in the relations among people it facilitates actions by actors. It's productive, like other forms of capital. It's not completely fungible. You can't do anything with it. It's scarce. There's not an infinite supply. It's a public good, and I'll be explaining what that means in just a moment. And it's not solely positive. So capital is not an unmitigated good, okay? You can do good things or bad things with money. You can hire someone to kill people with money. And, and, uh, and uh, a, a gun is not necessarily good or bad, okay? You can use it to hunt and get your food, or you can use it to kill people. It's a form of capital, a gun. Huh? It's a difficult, complex machine that requires skill and effort to manufacture. So social capital is not necessarily a good thing. You can use social capital for negative ends, right? To whip up a crowd into a frenzy and create a kind of, you know, Hitler Youth movement, for example, all right? So it's not solely positive. It's not lodged in the individual actors themselves. It's a property of groups. It's scarce. It's a public good. And as I've said, Coleman's conception differs from Bourdieu's conception, which I would call strictly a, uh, a type of cultural capital that inheres in individuals. And Putnam's, uh, Robert Putnam, who's a professor over here at Harvard in the uh, Kennedy School, Putnam's definition is closer to Coleman's, but Putnam emphasizes institutions how the role of institutions in the creation and maintenance of social capital, something which I think is important, but which is distinct from the kind of definition that I'm describing to you uh, today. And social capital, lastly, is not the same thing as social cohesion or as collective efficacy or other kinds of very warm concepts that we and others have described in the class. So as we saw a few lectures ago, different structures of people can have different properties. Connections matter to the group, and not just to the constituent individual. So this is a cartoon from a few lectures ago now, and we can begin to see the way in which this can uh, reflect the notion of social capital we've just discussed. We can take these 100 people, and by adding 99 connections, we can array them into a bucket brigade. This, pro this group has properties that this group did not have. This group, the telephone tree group, 
also 100 people, also 99 ties, they have different properties in this group. And those properties, even though the individuals are the same, give the group ability to produce and do things it wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Or here's the military squad, you know, a uh, company, 10, 100 men arranged into 10 squads of 10 men, densely interconnected, yet again, different properties. And actually, this idea that social capital is a property of a collection of individuals, a, coll a collection of individual entities that emerges um, uh, is, uh, and that is a property that did not exist before the connections were made uh, and could not have been foreseen by, the, uh, by studying the individuals themselves. So in other words, social capital is a, pro is, a, is a property of collections of individual components that emerges as a result of how you connect the components to each other, and furthermore is a property, social capital is, which you typically could not have foreseen just by studying the individual components themselves. And so the classic example that I've used, and probably half of you by now have seen this example in one form or another in various lectures that I've given, is of course the famous allotropes of carbon. So there are different forms of carbon that occur in nature. You all learn this in high school chemistry. On the left, you have graphite, which is soft and dark. And on the right, you have a diamond, which is hard and clear. And as you all learned, this had to do with how you connect the carbon atoms together. You take the carbon atoms and you connect them one way, you get graphite, which is soft and dark, it has one set of properties, connect them a different way, you get diamond, which has different properties. And there's still other forms of allotropes of carbon that either naturally occur or that we can manufacture, like carbon nanotubes uh, and so forth. But the key intellectual idea here that I'm interested in is that are, are the following. First, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness do not inhere in the carbon atoms. Those are not properties of the carbon per se. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms, the group of carbon atoms. Second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Connect them another way, you get a different set of properties. And in fact, the argument that I'm making is, is that it's the same with social systems. It's the ties between people that make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. New properties emerge there are new emergent properties of the system because of the connections, because of the ties between people, and not necessarily because of the people themselves. And our experience of the world depends on the actual structure of the ties around us, near and far. Now, there are other examples of this notion of emergence that occur in nature outside of chemistry. One of my favorite examples is taken from uh, biology. So here's one of the most simple organisms on the planet. It's an amoeboid fungus known as a slime mold. And the slime mold, raise your hands if you've been to, if you're from New England or been, yes, thank you. So you ever, like in the fall or if you've not been, if you weren't raised in New England but you're familiar with this, you raise wet leaves up and you see those little white tubes underneath the leaves that are forming a little meshwork? That's what this fungus does. Little individual cells in this fungus fuse with other nearby cells and they make a network on the forest floor, and they canvas for, um, for uh, cellulose. And what the fungus does is it finds a source of dead wood, it digests the dead wood, it distributes the nutrients towards the other fungal cells that are part of the network, and distributes the waste to the periphery and gets rid of it. So these individual little fungal cells fuse with each other, and they, their whole purpose in life is to digest wood and make these little networks on the forest floor. And this slime mold, however, infusing with other members of its species, forms a kind of superorganism, however, just like ant colonies, or as we argue and connected, just in some ways like humans, a kind of superorganism that has unexpected properties. For example, if I asked you if this slime mold was intelligent, was it smart? For example, could it solve mazes? You would say, what the hell are you talking about? And yet my colleague, Toshi Nakagaki, uh, at, uh, who's a Japanese mycologist, published a paper a few years ago in which he took this slime mold and on an auger plate cut out a, 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 a template of a, um, of a maze. And at the entrance and then the exit to the maze, he put some oat flakes, which are a kind of um, cellulose, source of cellulose. And then he, put, he let the slime mold do what it does. So here's a slime mold uh, bubbling up, kind of spreading out. They're fusing together, all the little stuff. Here's the oat flakes at the entrance and the exit. And what you're going to see in a minute is, is that the slime mold is going to be able to find the shortest path through this maze. All the other paths will die back except the one most efficient uh, path through the maze. So this slime mold is better able to solve mazes than Toshi's graduate students. 
Actually, not better than my graduate students. <laughs> Mine are better, uh, better, though many of them are here, actually. That's why I'm saying this. Uh, better, <laughs> better at solving mazes uh, than, uh, than the slime mold. Um, and so in, from my perspective, this, this type of maze-solving ability is a kind of primitive intelligence, perhaps. This slime mold has a kind of intelligence, a kind of maze-solving capacity, which could not have been foreseen from studying the individual components and which emerges and arises once the components are connected to each other. And in fact, this led to one, another one of my colleagues, Mark Fricker, who's a mycologist. He studies fungi at, at, uh, at Oxford University. Mark did this study. He took a map of England and on an auger plate, and he put oat flakes at every major city. And, uh, and on the right, this is the sort of network that the slime mold made through the oat flakes. And on the left is the railway network that human beings created over 200 years. Uh, and uh, then this network was shown to, to uh, British railway engineers, and they said, oh my god, this is brilliant. Why didn't we think about putting a trunk line from here to there or whatever? And this resulted in Mark Fricker, this humble uh, British mycologist, being appointed by the Queen to Her Majesty's Commission on the Rails uh, with other uh, <laughs> railway engineers to help design better railways thro uh, through the study of uh, fungal uh, behavior. And in fact, we see other similar kinds of behavior in the animal kingdom, and the point I'm making is that these behaviors are seen in the animal kingdom and also in our uh, species. Uh, for example, here's a related example. This is, some of you may have seen this. It made the rounds on YouTube a few years ago. These are the starlings of Otmore in England. So here's what these starlings do. Does anyone know how this behavior is occurring? Have you learned, any of you learned this yet? Raise your hands if you've been taught about how birds flock at Harvard. Wow, not a one of you has learned this. Great, I get to teach it to you. So, um, so is there a head starling that's giving orders? Yeah, who's yes? <laughs> yes, is there one starling? Okay, all of you guys, we're gonna fly in this direction now, and now we're gonna fly in this, no, there's not. So there's some other kind of way, there's some other kind of way that this can happen. And I'd like to actually do this experiment with you right now. So what I want you to do, listen carefully, I'm going to give you an instruction. I want you to all right now clap in unison. No, 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 no. Keep clapping until you achieve unison. Okay. So it took just like a second, like one or two seconds before you were all able to clap in unison. Was I like beating my hand to get you clap in unison? How did you do that? Yeah. That's right. Something like that. Each of you synchronized with the person next to you. You paid attention to what was happening next to you. And then each of you doing that very quickly, however, you were able to synchronize your actions. It's not as if originally it was thought when this problem was first begun to be studied in human populations with clapping in, or in orchestra halls that one person was clapping slightly louder than everyone else. You know and that all of the other people kind of tune their clapping to that one person. That's not what happens. Each of you yoke yourselves to the people next to you. And there are other, actually a variety of mathematical models, like spin Ising models. Raise your hands if you know what a spin Ising model is. Oh, God, thank God, at least one person. Uh, so, you know, with, mag with little magnetopoles in a field and how they align each other, and each of them only pays attention to the other little uh, particle next to it and so forth. Okay, so, um, and in fact, this has been studied now in all kinds of creatures. 
Uh, and here's one example. Um, uh, uh, I think this is birds. Yeah, this is birds. Well, actually, I'm showing you with fish, but imagine that these are birds. And you can actually create very simple rules for what the behavior of each individual bird will be. And by each individual bird evincing this simple behavior, the collectivity of birds then has a property that wasn't present within the individuals. So the three rules in this case might be remain close to your neighbors, move in the same direction as your neighbor, and avoid collisions with your neighbor. So here's an index fish or bird. Right in the middle here, you have a zone of repulsion. You, stay, you don't want to be too close to your neighbors. Uh, then you have a zone of alignment, swim in the same direction as your neighbors, and then a zone of attraction, stay, stay with the other fish. Don't, you know, go far away. Um, and if you did this, uh, you, a number of people have created so-called agent-based models where they've created little, little autonomous computer agents that obey these simple rules, and then they can model different kinds of behavior. And there's a very famous program, an artificial life program, developed by Craig Reynolds in 1986, which he called BOIDS, for birds, but pronounced BOIDS, B-O-I-D-S, which simulates flocking behavior uh, in birds. And so here's a simulation. To make this interesting, he also added two hawks. Uh, so here are predator birds. You see, these are the predator birds. And these hawks are going to be dive bombing uh, at, the, um, at, the, um, at the other birds, at the boys. These are not real birds. These are artificial birds. And they just are obeying these simple rules. You see, though, there's one of the hawks right there, and there's another one They're attacking the thing. And this looks surprisingly like the starlings of Otmore. Each little artificial agent obeying these three simple rules gives rise to the whole collection of birds evincing this kind of a property. Now, why? Why might uh, biological uh, creatures do this thing? We talked about, a couple of lectures ago, we talked about how, in the case of smoking cessation in humans, we might evince this kind of flocking behavior in our behavior. Remember, we talked about whole, like humans stopping smoking like a flock of birds changing direction. Actually, you can use a similar kind of insight, similar kind of mathematics to understand human social behavior similar to the way we can begin to understand this type of bird flocking behavior. But why do the birds do it? Well, in a paper that I think is one of the most brilliant papers that I've read in the last 10 years by Ian Cousin at, um, at, uh, at Princeton University, he, um, he did a, um, a very careful, he's done a number of beautiful studies of flocking behavior in animals. But one of the things he became interested in is and, and this is very hard to do, they have to tag and monitor individual birds' movements in enormous flocks of thousands of birds or bats or, or in thousands of fish, and they, they painstakingly take fish out of aquariums and paint them with little, like, barcodes and then track them with lasers as they fish move through in different groups. Um, and what he did was is the following thing. So imagine that you guys are, all of you constitute a flock of birds, and you're on the coast of California, and, um, and your task is to fly 3,000 miles over the open ocean and arrive at a little island in the middle of the ocean. Everyone understand the task? And each of you has a slight idea, has an idea of which way to, do, to fly. Northwest, north by northwest, north by north northwest. Each of you has a slightly different idea. Some of you might want to fly south, you know, but some of you want to fly in this direction and the other direction. Each of you has a slightly different idea. What would be the best way to maximize the likelihood that, uh, that you guys would all, as a flock, be able to arrive at the island correctly. What should we do with all of your individual opinions? Any ideas? Yeah? Yeah, so fly in the mean direction. That's exactly right. So I'm going to average all of the birds' individuals' opinions. The signal of where the right direction of the island is will be enhanced, and the noise will damp down. So collective hive mind, the, the summation of the opinions of all these birds, is most likely to maximize the likelihood that the flock of birds will survive, right? Because the bad outcome is they all fly out over the Pacific, there's no island out there, they all fall out of the sky and drown. Everyone with me so far? Okay, now imagine, however, that instead of the distribution being like I just described, you guys all wish to fly northwest, and you got north, and you guys all wish to fly west. Half the group wants to fly north, half the group wants to fly west. What should the birds do now? Split up. Okay, we're not going to let them split up. It's a good idea. Each could fly in their own preferred direction. We're not going to let them do that. What else can they do? Should they average their opinions? Should they average their opinions? Raise your hands if you think the birds should average their opinions. Raise your hands if you think they should not average their opinions. 
Raise your hands if you, okay, you don't think they should average their. Why not? Why shouldn't they average their opinions in this example I just gave? Come on, guys. Help me out here. Yes. Yeah, it's certainly not correct because half of them think the island is north and half of them think it's west. If they average and fly northwest, it's certain death. They'll all die if they fly that way, right? It's a stupid thing to do to average your opinion if you have big disagreements of opinion. Are you with me so far? So what do these birds do, guys? It's unbelievable. What they do is, is if they have small differences of opinion, they average their opinion. At some point when the differences of opinion get so large, instead of averaging their opinion, they vote. And they pick not the mean, but the modal desire. And why is the mode a better choice than the mean in this case, the north versus west? We said if they have a mean, if they fly into the mean direction, it's certain death for the whole flock. But if they pick the mode, what's likely to happen? 50% chance of surviving, 50% chance of death. So they've gone from certain death to 50% chance of surviving by switching from averaging their opinions to voting. And son of a gun, if that's not what the birds do. As Cousin showed in this paper, when the differences is small between the groups, they average their opinion. So this is the normalized probability of group direction here. By scale, I won't go into how it's done exactly. But at some very specific point, they switch from averaging to a winner-take-all strategy, and then they go, either we're going to go in this direction or in that direction. So two or many heads are better than one. And this is an astonishing behavior that's evinced not only, I would argue, by species like fish and birds and so forth, but in some ways by our species as well. And that is manifest in a whole variety of institutions that we have that can be seen going back thousands of years. Voting practices, consensus decision making, ways in which we pool our ideas, ways in which if we have big differences of opinion, we vote on them. If we have small differences, maybe we talk about them. So there are different kinds of ways we act that can be seen as similar. Now, I do not want you to leave this class thinking that Christakis said that we're just like birds and there's no difference. That's not true. I'm just saying that there are similar things we see in the natural world, and we humans are a part of the natural world. In my judgment, it is just ignorance when social scientists claim that there's no role of biology in, um, in you know, social processes, in culture. I'm not saying that we are biologically predetermined, but I am saying that it is ignorance to ignore the ways in which the behaviors that we evince are related to or rooted in behaviors that are seen in other um, species. So once again, the issue of social capital and emergence take us back to the question of how we explain social phenomena. Do we use the kind of notion of methodologic individualism for which explanations for social phenomena, such as social class, markets, power, institutions, must be formulated as or reducible to the characteristics or actions of individuals? Can we understand bird flocking just by understanding the individual birds? Or could, could we predict flocking just by studying? If you dissected a bird's brain, could you predict this kind of flocking behavior? Or do we need a kind of more holistic approach, methodological holism, which sees social entities, groups, institutions, networks, and so forth, as having a totality that is distinct from and that cannot be understood by merely studying its individual component elements. And holism, this idea of holism, is related to the notion of emergence. And social phenomena, such as culture, can have an enduring reality that transcends individuals. And as we've discussed before, Durkheim, for example, argued that social facts can and must be studied and explained independent of the individual. So social capital is complicated because certain aspects of social, and the argument here is that social capital is an emergent property of groups. We create social capital. Each of you guys goes about forming their friendships. You pick these people as friends, he picks these people as friends, and in so doing, you give rise to a social network structure, and that structure has certain properties which feed back and affect you, which place you at risk for germs, which place you at risk for violence, which give you access to information, that each of you, by acting in your own way and forming friendship connections and other, can give the group properties that was not present in you, but that nevertheless come to affect you. And so the argument here is that social capital um, is a byproduct of individual actions, but that it does not inhere in individuals. So what are some types of uh, social capital? Uh, we've seen that network topologies can contain capital. Organizing people in one way can insulate them from infection. For example, you take people and you don't allow anyone to be connected to anyone else. If you want to prevent epidemics of sexually transmitted diseases, outlaw sex. 
no one has sex with anyone else, you're not going to get epidemics of STDs. That's a very simple network topology, no connections between anyone. Very good for the individuals if you're trying to prevent an epidemic. Um, other kinds of things that Coleman talks about are trustworthiness. We alluded to that earlier. Information channels, norms. You know, are you in a society which has norms that are actually useful to you or groups? Um, or appropriable social organizations. And, um, and for example, Coleman gives the example that you guys, you guys get together to be in the Glee Club and then actually use the Glee Club as a way to find a ride to New York City, right? The, the formation of this group gives you some access to something valuable, namely getting a ride that wasn't present before and that you wouldn't otherwise have been able um, to do. And all of these things are linked to social structure. Now, ways of measuring social capital, there are a variety of ways that you can do it. Um, you can use um, measures of interpersonal trust. You want to measure, okay, how much social capital is in this group? You can ask individuals how much do they trust each other. You can map the network architecture of the group. Uh, you can measure income inequality, might be a proxy for social capital, uh, and so forth. And as I've already alluded to, it's worth noting that social capital can also be put to bad ends, just like some types of material capital, like guns, or human capital, like bomb-making uh, knowledge. And for example, note that bad health habits could be enforced by local norms. So for example, just because the group is able to have a normative constraint on the constituent individuals doesn't mean it will constrain the desirable behavior to come out. Many of you probably started smoking because you thought it was the cool thing to do and your friends were doing it. There is an action, a so, a, an effect of social capital that's not necessarily a good effect. And pertinently, differently situated individuals may be differentially able to tap social capital or access it. Now, one of the properties we mentioned earlier about social capital is that it is a public good. And the thing about public goods are, public goods um, uh, have a number of properties. And so, for example, the light coming out of a lighthouse is a public good. A private good, for example, is a piece of cake. You have a piece of cake. It's your piece of cake. If you eat that piece of cake, I can't eat it. You've consumed it. And unless you give it to me, I don't have access to that. But a lighthouse which throws out light, for example, is a public good. There's non-exclusive use. My using the light from the lighthouse doesn't stop you from using the light from the lighthouse. It's not at all like the piece of cake. It arises as a byproduct. So I build the lighthouse because I want to create, keep my ships from crashing onto the shore, but all of you benefit. So I invest, I make the investment, and it creates this byproduct effect. Typically, we underinvest in, uh, in public goods because of the tragedy of the commons that you guys read about. Uh, and, and also, um, social, and, uh, this type of uh, public good is difficult to create. So there are a number of examples like this. Uh, lighthouse, uh, fireworks, uh, air is a public good. I, my breathing doesn't affect your breathing. The national defense is a public good. You know, we, all of you supporting the national defense, I get to benefit from that too, even if I, uh, I don't contribute. Um, now, the question becomes why uh, other than sort of naturally creating social capital and public goods, why do we underinvest in uh, public goods? And this, this, this underinvestment can sometimes arise because of a class of phenomena known as social traps. Now, a classic example of this has to do with Route 28, which until fairly recently was, uh, was a, sort of a two-lane highway. Here's Route 28 that spans all of Cape Cod and that you would have to you know, follow if you wanted to get all the way up um, to Provincetown. And it used to become absurdly, cr absurdly crowded with traffic uh, on weekends when people would pile up into the car and put all their stuff and their people in the car and drive out uh, to the Cape. So here's an example of one, uh, one man that's going away uh, for the weekend up to the Cape and unfortunately there's trouble in store for him uh, and his fellow travelers because while he's driving along he did not properly uh, secure the mattress onto the roof of his car and this gave rise to a very famous a uh, social uh, trap problem known as the mattress on Route uh, 28 uh, problem. So, um, so he's driving along, and his mattress, shown in yellow here, flies off his car and blocks one of the lanes on the highway. And the question I'm asking you guys is, why does no one remove the mattress? Why does traffic back up for miles, causing injury to everybody, and nobody gets out of their cars and removes the mattress? Why not? Ideas. Yeah. Yes. I'm gone. Okay, so those are the guys, those are the real annoying jerks in, in zone three. 
So they've been waiting for miles, and they're saying, well, let all the other suckers wait like I did. They see the mattress here, and they, like, just drive by it. What about the guys in zone one? Why don't they deal with the mattress problem? What? The traffic, I'm sorry, is flowing in this direction, guys, okay, from left to right. Why don't the guys in zone one deal with the mattress problem? They have no clue what the problem is. They're just stuck in traffic. They don't know that there's a mattress on. If they did, what would they do? They'd get out and run ahead and move the mattress, but they don't. Ditto with the guys in zone two. They may see the mattress up ahead, the guys in zone two, but they may feel, look, I've waited all this distance. I'm just, you know, why should I stop now? Zone three says there's really no incentive. And zone four, they're beyond the mattress. They have absolutely no payoff to pull over and go back and pull uh, and remove the mattress. So there are many problems like this uh, that exist in, uh, in our interactions. Free rider problems in vaccination. The best thing each of you can do is hope that everyone else gets vaccinated for disease, but not get vaccinated yourself. So you benefit from the fact that there's no epidemic in the population because of vaccination, uh, but you don't incur the cost or the risk of vaccination. Of course, if everyone behaved that way, we'd have epidemics all the time. Or the tragedy of the commons uh, problem that I discussed uh, before. Or, um, or a problem which I think I have time uh, to do. Let me see if I have, any one of the TFs have a dollar? You have a dollar? Anshul, thank you. Let me have a dollar. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something right now that illustrates some of these phenomena. And if you've ever seen this done before, just be a good sport. So I'm going to auction off this dollar. Okay, I'm going to auction this dollar. And uh, in order to make it simple and fair, I'm going to have just two rules because I'm about to give away a dollar. The first rule is that you can only increase by five cent increments. So we're not going to do this penny at a time. So as you bid for this dollar, you have to do five cent increments. Everyone with me? That's rule number one. And you can't skip. We have to go up by fives. Everyone with me? The second is, because I'm about to auction off this dollar and probably lose this dollar, I'm going to require that not only the highest bidder, but the next highest bidder also give me the money, even though the dollar is only going to go to the highest bidder. That's the second rule. Two rules. Rule number one, you can only bid in five cent increments. Rule number two, I'm going to collect both the highest and the second highest bidder. Everyone understand the rules? All right. I'm giving away the dollar. Who bids five cents? Raise your hands. Yes, five cents. Ten cents. Ten cents. Yes. Fifteen. Yes. Twenty. Yes. Twenty-five. Yes. Thirty. Thirty cent bid. Again, thirty-five. Call out your bids from now on. Who bids forty? Forty. Do I have forty-five? Fifty. Fifty-five. I can't go up to 95, got to go by five cent increments. <laughs> Not paying attention to the rules. <laughs> so I have who bid 55? Raise your hands. Who bid 50? Come on, who bid 50? Someone bid 50. 50, okay. So you bid 50, you bid 55. What just happened? What? I made a profit. I'm going to get 55 cents from her and 50 cents from her. That's exactly right. So I, I'm going to make some money now. Did you foresee that? Some of you may have. Most of you probably didn't. Okay, here I am, 55 cents. Do I give it to her? 60. 65. 70. 70. Raise your hand so I can see you now. 75. Yeah, call them out. 75. No anonymous, sure, shill bidding. Raise your hand. 75, okay. Eight. Raise your hands, please, so I can see you. 80, okay. 85. Raise your hands. 90, 95, a dollar, I have a dollar bid on a dollar. What? You bid 95, right? Okay, 95. Who, raise your hands if you bid 95. Come on, be fair. 95, okay, and you bid a dollar. What are you going to do now? No, no, I'm going to keep my dollar 95. She's paying me a dollar and she's paying me 95 cents. What are you going to do? Why is it rational for her to bid a dollar five? Hold on, one at a time. Raise your hands. Why is it rational for her to bid a dollar five? Yeah. Correct. So if she pays a dollar and you pay 95 cents, you're out 95 cents. But if you bid a dollar five, what happens? You get the dollar and you only lose five cents, right? You gonna bid a dollar five? Oh come on, Aria! I'm trying to achieve a pedagogic objective here. 
What? 105. What are you going to do now? No. <laughs> okay, so you see the point, though, right? Because then it's rational for him to go to 110. So what happens is, is all of you are led, and you two can come down afterwards. I'll sign this dollar, and you can have it. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I'll two different hats. So eat, although every one of you, <laughs> and if there were more that bid, I'll give away a few dollars. Okay, Anshul, could you give me some bucks, please? Uh, <laughs> so... So the point is, even though there were two simple rules, you all knew the rules, you were all led to an outcome that was suboptimal, with full rational appreciation ex ante. It's not like the prisoner's dilemma game necessarily. This is a different kind of game where the rules are completely transparent right from the beginning. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the social scientist who invented this dollar auction. Does someone remember offhand? Uh, where is it? It's in my notes here somewhere. Ah, Martin Schubick, S-H-U-B-I-K illustrates the paradox brought about by traditional rational choice theory in which players with perfect information in the game are compelled to make, are compelled to make ultimately irrational decisions based completely on a sequence of rational choices made throughout the game. Every single one of you bidders made a rational choice, but ultimately you're all led to an irrational outcome that emerges from the sequence of rational choices that you all made. And of course, as you read in the famous paper, The Tragedy of the Commons, that was assigned for today, each individual deciding whether or not to graze his or her cattle on the commons makes the rational choice because the cost of his grazing is borne by the collective, divided by all the farmers, but the benefit accrues just to him. All of you graze, and as a result, the commons is overgrazed in this highly influential paper by uh, Garrett, Garrett Hardens. And nevertheless, the rational response of each individual remains the same at every stage since the gain is always greater to each herder than the individual share of the distributed cost. Um, and Hardin describes this as a tragedy because it's the remorseless working of things. And as such, it illustrates how an invisible hand or laissez-faire approaches to resource problems need not always provide the expected optimal solution. And in Hardin's hypothetical commons, the actions of self-interested individuals do not promote the public good. So Hardin is arguing against Smith, right? Adam Smith is arguing about markets and being efficient. Everyone acting in their own interests results in the emergence of a collective property of markets which are above individuals, which are better than individuals. Hardin saying, no, that need not be the case. Yeah. Yes, in the end, the two people get trapped. That's right. Some people can jump in, like some of you guys were jumping in. Yes. You might go up to a dollar or infinitesimally approach it because until you actually bid a dollar, you, don't, um, you can gain something from that. Once you bid a dollar, then what happens is that the person just below you, or once you bid asymptotically a dollar, the person below you has an incentive to go across the, ba the boundary. And then in the end, the game is played just like here with two people. I mean, some random person could have bid a dollar ten just for amusement, but that's not actually you know, what happens. Yeah, you were going to say something right behind her? Yes, you could intervene. Yeah, you could have done a variety of things to corrupt the auction and, you know, marketify the risk and so forth, but we're not going to go into all of those things. All right. So, um, so, um, so and it's because of such social traps, like the dollar auction, the tragedy of the commons, the prisoner's dilemma, the uh, mattress on Route 28, and so forth, as well as for other reasons, that we humans have formal institutions to deal with these problems. We constitute a government. We have voluntary groups. And these are all examples of how groups, might, these trap examples are all examples of how groups might underinvest in public goods and how they come to do foolish things as a group that make sense as individuals. And so what we can do to countermand that tendency is we have, you know, groups of volunteers or institutions we hire, we create a department of public, you know, safety or whatever, whose job it is to go out and clear the mattress from the highway because no individual has the uh, incentive to do that. And in short, social capital, which is a public good, is valuable and is worth the investment. It can yield a very high rate of return in terms of socially valued goods such as public safety, education, and health. And social capital, we can think about deliberately creating social capital in groups of people and deploying it for good ends rather than just for bad ends 
in a variety of uh, situations, in youth and schools, by improving civics education or community service programs, in workplaces, by providing incentives for firms that promote volunteerism and social connection, in urban design, by limiting sprawl or other sorts of architectural, you know, I, if I change, you know, if I take river houses and make them into FOHO, where everyone has to walk not through entryways, seriously, if you think about the entryway design, what happens in an entryway? You only are familiar with, you're only intimately familiar with the people in your own entryway who you only periodically bump into as they're coming in and out. Whereas if I organized you onto vast floors, you would have more connections with each other. It might or might not be a good thing. I'm not going to actually make a strong claim, but I am going to make a claim that the design of that built environment can affect your connections. Or in politics and government, social capital impact assessment programs, or policies that strengthen caregiving of diverse sorts. So I'm just going to leave you with one of my favorite quotes in this regard by RFK. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, by RFK. Uh, at the University of Kansas in March of 1968. Here's what he said, which is the point that I've been trying to make, much less eloquently. Half a million American children suffer from serious malnutrition, and I've seen some of them. I've, some, I've seen personally some of them starving in the state of Mississippi, their stomachs bloated, their bones and their bodies scarred, many of them retarded for life. Up to 80% of some Indian tribes are unemployed, and the suicide rate among the high school children is shockingly high, dozens of times the national average. For the black American of the urban ghetto, we really do not know what its unemployment rate is, because from one-fifth to one-third of these adult men in these areas have literally dropped out from sight, uncounted and unknown by all of the agencies of government, drifting about the cities without hope and without family and without a future. By these standards, we are not so rich a country. Truly, we have a great gross national product, almost $800 billion. But can, but can that be the criterion by which we judge this country? Is it enough? And then here's what he says. For the gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and jails for the people who break them. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. And the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of our education, the joy of their play. It is indifferent to the decency of our factories and the safety of our streets alike. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither wit nor courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our duty to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile, and it can tell us everything about America except why we are proud to be Americans. See you next time. <laughs>